So what we're going to look at today is the force acting on an object. We are going to identify the forces acting on an object. We are going to draw free body diagrams representing the forces acting on a single body, right? So we, we need to label the forces accurately. And secondly, we need to draw diagrams to show what's going on. So the first force that we're going to talk about is weight. Weight is the force acting on an object due to its position in a gravitational field. This is what we looked at in the previous lesson. Now, when we draw forces acting on an object, we must always use the center of the object. And weight is no exception. So we use the center of mass, which approximately equates to its actual geographic center in the middle. So every time you draw an arrow, you must show that it's going through the center of that object. And then um, you use a nice straight line to represent the force acting, um, in this case, because it's weight, always towards the center of the planet, which is provoking the field, right? So in this case, it's acting down. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Now, contact forces are our second type of force. And specifically, we're going to talk about the normal force. Normal always refers to at 90 degrees to. So when we we talk about a normal force, we st we are stating that it's a force at 90 degrees to the surface, right? So that's the surface of contact and perpendicular to it is the normal force. So why does this normal force happen? Because the box in this case is on the table being pulled down by weight as a reaction to that the table is now pushing up. So another another um, name for the normal force is the reaction force, which kind of make more sense. The normal force is the reaction of two surfaces touching, okay? So in this case, the reaction or normal force is in opposition and caused by the weight acting on an object. I hope that made sense. So what's our second type of contact force? That is um, force that's caused because two objects are touching, right? Well, our second type is friction. Friction is a consequence of two objects. Frictional Friction forces are a consequence of two objects touching because even on a microscopic le level, even if something looks smooth, on a microscopic level, it's actually probably quite rough. And when you have two surfaces that are, that have, a, you know, that kind of rough edge to them, they interlock and they stop each other from moving. So frictional forces are caused by the interlocking of surface features of two objects. And what's important about this frictional force is that it's always opposite to the way that two objects are moving, right? Or would like to move. There's actually two types of frictional force, static and dynamic. And we'll look at those in the next lesson. But basically, friction is always opposite to the way that the object is moving or the way that it's about to move. Again, more on that later. Now, the next type of force is also a contact force, but it's an applied force. So, um, Basically, uh, tension is the name for a force which is used to pull apart an object. So this could be tension. But again, it's applied. You have to come along and apply that force. Or compression, again, which is an applied force. Another example of an applied force is thrust, the engine. That's an applied force uh, on an object which is trying to move it. Next kind of contact force is... Up thrust, lift, and drag. Now, these are forces that are associated with fluids and will act whether an object is at rest or moving. Okay, so up thrust is specific to objects which are immersed and provoke floating or some kind of flotation reaction. Up thrust is a buoyancy, it's caused by buoyancy effects, the displacement of liquid. So if I put this stone inside liquid, it pushes the liquid out, right? Which causes that liquid 
to push back in, right? So this rock, by being in that liquid, is pushing that out. So this is actually for trying to react and pushes back in, and that's what makes things float. We don't do a lot of that in the IB, but it is an interesting field to look at. So up thrust is always in opposition to weight. It's a little bit like reaction in that sense. And then we have drag. Now drag relates to the movement of an object in a fluid. And by fluid, we mean a liquid or a gas. So it's kind of the liquid and gas equivalent to friction, right? If an object is trying to move that way, through air, drag will act in the opposite way. Same if you've got a boat moving through water, drag will move the other way. Drag in air is often called air resistance. It doesn't mean it's something different, it's the same thing, but it relates to specifically air and nothing else. Okay, so important notation. You should really use the following notation when labeling forces. Weight is W, reaction R, or you can use capital N. I'm good with that. That's fine. If we're considering drag, you should use F, capital F and a small subscript D. Up thrust, capital F and a small subscript, subscript um, U. And friction is notated by using an italics F. Okay, it's super important that you use this notation consistently. When we're drawing forces as well, you should always try to the best of your ability to draw the arrows to represent the size approximately. So for example, here, thrust and weight and drag are approximately the same size. Now that has consequences to the movement. These two are the same, so therefore this will be moving at a constant speed. This lift and this weight are the same, so we can see that it's not changing its height. So the relative size of the forces is very important, and you must make the effort to try and uh, present diagrams representatively that show the size of the forces. Okay? Right. Um, let's go straight on to free body diagrams. This is just a repetition. Um, although it would be quite nice for you to see, here we have some very, very typical IB style uh, force diagrams where you can see the relative sizes of the forces and the correct notation, always through the center of the object so we can see what's going on. This is a nice one, a slope one, where you can see the weight is acting straight down. Friction is acting in opposition to motion, which is down the slope. And here we have our normal force, which is perpendicular to the surface. All of these are important points. Now, what is a free body diagram? By definition, a free body diagram shows the force acting on a mass, only on one specific mass. So, for example, if we have a look at this asteroid approaching the Earth, it's a situational diagram, then a free body diagram of the Earth would only show the forces acting on the Earth, and the free body diagram for an asteroid would only show the forces acting on the asteroid. You would only ever draw a free body diagram for one object at a time. And here we have our free body diagram for the asteroid. Um, as you can see, the free body diagram for the asteroid shows the gravitational force of the Earth on the asteroid. And the important thing is on one object, the asteroid. If we want to represent what's happening to the Earth, on the Earth, we need to show that in a separate free body diagram for the Earth, right? So here is our free body diagram for the Earth that is also experiencing a gravitational force, but this time from the asteroid. We draw the fruit body diagrams from the center, acting in the direction of the force. They are also the same size, right? Because they're equal. This is also a very good time to look at Newton's law of motions. We will consider them in more detail later. But at this stage, I do want to remind you of law three. For every action, there is always an equal and opposite reaction. Now this is an important one to consider when we're looking at free body diagrams for pairs of objects that are interacting. This particular exercise illustrates it perfectly. 
the asteroid is attracting the Earth, so therefore, Newton's third law, the Earth is attracting the um, asteroid. Equal and opposite. Each of those forces is acting in an opposite direction on a different body. So it would be represented on a different diagram. The other Newton's law that is relevant to free body diagrams is this idea of a body being at rest. Um, a body will remain at rest. That means um, stay still. Or it will go um, at a constant speed. It will remain in motion, in constant motion, unless it's acted on by an external force, a resultant force. Now, why does this relate to uh, free body diagrams? Because free body diagrams only ever tell you about one object. They show all the forces that are acting, all the forces that are acting. You should be able to tell from a free body diagram uh, whether it's accelerating or not. If the forces acting on the body are, um, if there is a resultant force acting, then it will accelerate. So this Earth now is accelerating thanks to this asteroid. Hang on a minute, that's a bit weird. But uh, I'll leave you to think about that one and why the Earth is not suddenly accelerating um, because of this asteroid. We can discuss this in class. The last task, example number two, is what's happening here. We have a box on planet Earth. Um, what are the free body diagrams for both of these objects? Well, the first object that we can see is a box. So let's take that first. On this box, we have the gravitational force of the moon pulling the box down. So our first force here is weight. Then, because the box is on the planet, right, or the moon or the surface, because it's touching contact force, then we have a reaction force up, which is equal to this weight. Hang on a minute, how do we know that they're equal? Well, is this box accelerating through space? It is not. Is it flying through the moon's surface, like down to the center of the moon? No, it's not, it's stable. So therefore, the forces are balanced, right? So that's how we would um, draw the free body diagram for this box. Two forces equally balanced. Our second free body diagram for this situation is of the moon on its own, right? So again, this moon is not accelerating anywhere, so it must have a balanced set of forces. Well, think about Newton's third law, equal and opposite. Now we have a gravitate as we we had a gravitational force here, right? The gravitational pull of the uh, moon on the box. So therefore, now on the moon we have a gravitational force up uh, by the box. There is it has to be there has to be an equal and opposite Newton's third law pair on this force acting upwards, um, and that's your first force. Your second force is a contact force. If you have a contact force up of the moon on the box, you have a Newton's pair force here, which is of the box on the moon. All right, so now what we end up with, let's have a look at this moon. Is it balanced? It's balanced. We don't have an accelerating moon flying through space. Uh, that's because um, the two, two forces are balanced. I hope that's made sense. We will review this in class. Now try the assignment.